It seems that living at this time during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic makes it so that every day is a day in which we're exploring viruses. However, it seems that commonly we have still misconceptions um, about what a virus is and really how it is transmitted and uh, how it replicates and all of the nuances about whether it's considered living or not living. So in this first virus lecture, I want to talk about about a little bit about the history, and then you're going to explore the replicative strategy. Let's begin by looking at the history, then we can dive in a little bit to morphology. Um, it was a very, very wise person who um, said that the first person to discover something is rarely credited. Um, in fact, there's a quote by Francis Galton, in science, credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not the man to whom the first idea occurred. And this is very true. And the other thing that is telltale about that quote is that it is all about men. <laughs> and yet, in the history of viruses, much of the credit belongs to women. All the way back in the beginning of the 18th century, early 1700s, a woman named Lady Wortley Montague was married to the English ambassador to Turkey. They spent a great deal of time in Turkey, and Lady Wortley Montague herself had a deep infatuation with viruses. It was a very much a, a, a love-hate relationship. She was fascinated by them, but she was also deeply scarred by them. Actually, physically, she was scarred by smallpox, but additionally, her brother had died of smallpox. So she um, noticed in Turkey that locals were, in, in fact, um, vaccinating their children with a small attenuated dosage um, of a virus in order to, pr to protect them from viral infection. When she returned to England, she tried to convince people about vaccination and that that was something that could work. Um, but of course, as we just talked about, this claim fell on mostly deaf ears and not much was done scientifically um, until the very late 1700s when a man named Edward Jenner decided that it would be a good idea to listen to a young dairy maid. So in May of, of 1796, Edward Jenner found a young dairy maid. Her name was Sarah. She had a fresh cowpox lesion on her hands and arms. And then on May 14th of 1796, um, she, she, of course, claimed that she would, no, would not get the smallpox because she had had cowpox. So then on May 14th of 1796, using the matter from Sarah's lesions, uh, Edward Jenner inoculated an eight-year-old boy, James was his name, and the boy developed a mild fever, some discomfort. Um, nine days la later, he felt cold and had lost his appetite, but he, the next day he felt much better. In July of then 1796, or that same year, he inoculated the boy again. This time he did so with smallpox. Um, so different kinds of ethics going on here at the time in research. But what he found was that no disease developed. So this was the first example, or at least the person who spoke the, the most convincingly um, about uh, the idea of vaccination. So this was the uh, first documented vaccination. You could read more about this in um, the Baylor's Proceedings of um, the University Medical Center in a 2005 article entitled entitled Edward Jenner and the History of Smallpox and Vaccination. So this was um, an important historical moment. Um, so too, a little bit later in, in well, quite a bit later, almost 100 years later, um, in, in the late 1800s, Charles Chamberlain was the first to show us the difference between um, infectious agents. Up until Charles Chamberlain, um, really we were uh, uncertain about the difference between infectious agents that were viruses and infectious agents that were bacteria. And and what Charles Chamberlain did is that he made this filter and he was able to observe that certain infect infection, 
infectious agents would pass through the filter, the viruses, of course, because they're small, and the bacteria would get stuck smack dab on the filter and get held onto. So we had these two classifications of infectious agents. We had the ones that would pass through a filter and the ones that would get stuck on the filter. So this sort of size exclusion um, argument for differences between infectious agents. So then we started to understand them as a little bit different and to recognize them as obligate intracellular parasites. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So this work of Charles Chamberlain gave rise to sort of the classification of virus, um, originally meaning toxin or poison. In 1911, two Scandinavian scientists, and yes, their names sound extremely Scandinavian, um, Olaf Bang and Wilhelm Ellerman, and they found that um, certain malignancies in chickens were caused by viruses, and that began our long relationship with the knowledge that viruses can cause cancer. Um, a little bit later, in, in, in 1915, bacteriophage, or the viruses that affect bacteria, were discovered. And we got this notion of, wow, even germs can get germs, if uh, said in that way. And then finally, in, um, in 1935, Wendell Stanley crystallized tobacco mosaic virus, and he was actually able to recognize that viruses are in fact composed uh, largely of protein, and that that really does differentiate them from the cells that we think of as comprising uh, bacterial life or other forms of life. So this is, um, this is a, a very snapshot of the history of viruses, but I think it's important right now for us to contextualize where does the history of the coronaviruses sit in this. And in fact, it was in the 1960s that people first recognized and characterized the coronaviruses. And it, in fact, it's really awesome to also note that this was additionally was a woman. Um, and so this is actually an image of her from BBC. You can read more about this on BBC the woman who discovered the first coronavirus. Uh, her name was June, and she was um, the daughter of a Scottish bus driver. She left school at the age of 16 and was an incredibly successful virologist. Um, so she is to credit with our first, uh, the, the beginnings of our first knowledge of the coronaviruses. Let's talk about viruses then I promised I would say more about them being obligate intracellular parasites. So this means that they only replicate within a host. So uh, Max has been emailing me with a number of questions and I'm gonna try to entertain some of his questions here. So this notion of being obligate intracellular parasite means that a virus can sit in its non-replicative form on, say, for example, a surface. We call those surfaces fomites if you can touch one of them and you can get a disease from that. Now, that seems actually pretty uncertain with coronavirus right now, like that, that some of that transmission is a little bit uncertain. But it means, obligate intracellular parasite means that um, these viruses can only replicate when they are inside of a host, when they're sitting as a virion, okay, so when it's outside of the host, sitting on a cardboard box or something like that, then it is a virion. When it's inside of the host and it's replicating, then it's in its replicative form, so its intracellular form, um, and that's when we would say that it is active, it is active, right, um, that it's actually replicating one. Otherwise, it's really just basically dormant. It's really just a proteinaceous structure with uh, nucleic acids that is not doing anything in that form. Well, we can look at these viruses with respect to size. Virion size ranges from 10 to 300 or 400 nanometers. That makes them about 100 to 1,000 times smaller than the cells that they infect, right? That's why it turned out that Chamberlain could filter them through the filter, whereas virus or as bacteria did not get filtered through. So how does, um, so we'll look at some examples, parvoviridae, we recognize that in causing parvo in wolves and in dogs, you may have heard of that, it's a tiny, teeny, itsy bitsy little um, naked virus, it's just an icosahedron, a protein capsid with nucleic acids inside of it. 20 nanometers, very, very little. Remember your bacteria that you looked at, the small ones were like one micrometer. We're talking on the order of, the difference here is we're at 10 to the minus ninth as our units here, whereas you are looking at 10 to the minus sixth. So if you think 
whoa, you've got to go a thousand times smaller before you're going to see these guys. Um, pox viride now, on the other hand, are very, very large. So those that cause smallpox, like we talked about um, with Lady Wortley Montague, those are large viruses, very complex viruses. They have a very um, complex sort of virion structure. Now, where does uh, where do coronaviruses sit in all of this? Well, they're somewhere on the order of um, somewhere between. 80-ish to 150-ish nanometers. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is 120 nanometers. That's a large, a pretty large virus. Um, and it kind of depends on whether you, you measure the spikes in that. Usually people don't measure the spikes in that measurement. So now let's look a little bit at the different um, morphologies that a virus can take. One of the most common is an icosahedron. An icosahedron is 20 equilateral triangles. Those triangles are made up of proteinaceous the protomers, uh, and they're, the proteins form pentamers within these triangles. Um, so small pentamers make up then the larger uh, protomer that it makes up the, um, the panes, if you will, of proteins that form the triangles. This is very wise to make a nucleocapsid or to make a capsid in that shape because it is the most efficient way to package space. You might have seen a greenhouse or a house built in this shape. Smart people because they're maximizing the space that they get from, from that um, structure. So this can fit a larger amount of nucleic acid than another structure could. So we have the protein coat or the capsid and then inside we have the nucleic acid. So Together, this is called the nucleocapsid, the nucleic acid plus the protein coat. Now on that, we often will see spikes. These spikes we know are responsible for adsorbing to, attaching to the surface receptors on a host cell. An example of a naked virus is the polio virus. The polio virus is, um, is only a protein capsid and nucleic acids um, rather than having an outer envelope around it. Now, not all viruses are icosahedron. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 is not an icosahedron. It's helical. However, it is enveloped, meaning that it has a phospholipid bilayer around it. Um, so uh, another example of a helical virus, tob tobacco mosaic virus is an example, but the most the most iconic example is, of course, Ebola. Ebola is a very, very long helical virus. In fact, it looks in images kind of like a worm because it's so long. And that's because it needs that space to fit its genome inside of it. Um, so now many viruses are enveloped. SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus. Um, it's a helical spherical enveloped virus. So you can kind of picture those things coming together. Herpes virus is another example of an enveloped virus. A lot of smooth criminal viruses are enveloped because um, that means that they look like the host. Because where do you think they get that phospholipid bilayer? from the host. So when they leave a host cell, they bud off and they take their envelope with them. So you get this outer membranous layer um, there. Now also that can have spikes on it. And we know with SARS-CoV-2, there are spikes. Um, you're gonna get to meet Gabby. If Maybe you all have met Gabby already. She likes it when I talk on the vodcast. Um, so it has the spikes. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has the S spike and it has specifically the S1 component of that spike is what recognizes the angiotensin uh, receptor. Um, so that um, the, if you've heard ACE2, right, is the receptor, that's the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that is what the virus exploits. And that, and it is exploitation. So when this um, S1 protein component of the spike binds to the ACE2 receptor, it's exploiting that receptor, meaning that it's using it, it's using that ACE2 receptor for something that it's not supposed to be used for. <laughs> So then we can um, finish off here by talking about complex viruses. Bacteriophage are complex viruses, but so too are things like the pox viruses that we saw that have sort of these unusual morphologies. They're not really icosahedral, they're not really helical. Quick note, uh, viruses can also be pleomorphic. And in fact, we see that we see that on a lot of, of, of notorious viruses. And um, we see some pleomorphy in influenza viruses, but also coronaviruses can be pleomorphic. That means shapeshifter, right? Remember that 
Let's look inside now at the um, nucleic acids of the virus, the viruses, and talk about the different types of nucleic acids that can be found inside of the capsid. Um, so we can see double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, so double-stranded DNA viruses, such as varicella zoster virus, are very famous. VZV um, causes the chickenpox. So I know many of you were vaccinated against the chickenpox, but my senior year of high school, I had the most raging case of chickenpox. Actually, uh, I ran my state cross-country running race or the day I was coming down with it. It was insane. And I was, woo, I was, I was it was rough. I had a rough case of VZV. Um, Single-strand RNA viruses, well, remember that SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus. Also, it is joined by the rhinoviruses that cause a common cold. Um, additionally, uh, the polioviruses. So there's a lot of viruses that have that single-stranded RNA um, genome, positive sense, right? Five prime to three prime. There are, though, some single-stranded DNA viruses. So parvovirus is an example of that. Um, there are human parvoviruses as well. B19 is an example of that. Now, there are also double-stranded RNA viruses. This is crazy, right? The idea that you could that you would see it come in as double-stranded RNA because that, that molecule tends to be antigenic. Remember with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it keeps that at very low concentrations because it alerts our body to its presence because single double-stranded RNA is not something we're used to seeing in our body. So it tends to be uh, very um, alerting to our immune system. Um, but rotaviruses, wow, rotaviruses, we've all had one. They're the ones that cause you to have a tummy bug, a tummy upset, gastroenteritis. And in fact, um, rotaviruses are a major issue worldwide. Um, more than 800,000 children every year die of rotaviruses and they die of dehydration because uh, that they're a diarrheal disease, right? So that's actually something interesting to, to keep in mind. So let's entertain another one of Max's question. Um, I wonder where do viruses get their nutrients from? This is such a great question, Max. Um, it's like I can't seem to find an answer for this question in any of the scholarly journals or otherwise. From what I read, viruses can't sporulate to preserve themselves, and I'm not sure what mechanisms they use to survive. So how are they living, quote unquote, um, on nothing but like say glass? You know, he was noticing that they can stay capable of causing infection, if you will, like they're still capable of becoming replicative. So Max, this is a good question. Viruses um, are not really uh, in and of themselves metabolic. So remember when they're outside of the host, they're not doing anything. They're literally sitting there a lot like a spore, actually. They, they, um, they do not do anything when they're outside of the host. So it's only when they're inside of the host that any energy reserves are needed. And then they they usurp that from the host. So they take the host's energy generating systems in order to replicate their genome, in order to um, make their capsid, in order to um, undergo budding and leave a cell or whatever way they get it out of the cell. Um, so they are usurping the host completely. Now, this may be in part why viruses have typically been considered to be not living by most scientists. Now, on the flip side, some scientists would argue that maybe we should rethink our definitions of life. Like, really, in the end of the day, what does it mean to be alive? Um, in the past, people have said viruses are not living because they don't have both DNA and RNA at the same time. Um, in their virion. So they have either one or the other. And so this has been a category used to call them non-living. But I think it's really fascinating to debate these things. And so you're kind of asking that question, well, what mechanism are they using to survive when, say, they're on a glass surface, right? Um, well, they're, they're just hanging out because all they are is protein and nucleic acid. And particularly if you have a DNA virus, that nucleic acid is really stable. RNA viruses are not really that stable and enveloped RNA viruses are not that that super stable. You know, we could see a DNA virus, it could hang out for a very long time on a surface. 
Um, just today, CDC came out with something saying that we are, we're not really documenting cases um, of SARS-CoV-2 fr from fomites, right, from surfaces so much as from other people. So at this point, what I would say is we're still studying this, right? We're still trying to understand it. Um, and some transmission might be able to occur via fecal oral route means. So remember this, like if you have a box that's come to your house and you, you're worried about it, um, you can wear gloves uh, or just remember to wash your hands before you touch your face because what's going on there is you have to get it from that fomite into your body. That's pretty unlikely. It's a lot more likely that when you're hanging out with a friend of yours, that person coughs and you suck in the respiratory droplets. That's a lot more likely. So um, just remember to wash your hands if you touch something and don't touch your face. So, so I hope that helps, Max. And these are really, really great questions. Um, so we're going to dive into some activities to, today. Um, um, and I hope um, that, that you've enjoyed this um, quick virus lecture.